theyeshiva.net. Today's shear is dedicated by Dr. Michael and Liz Michelle, in loving memory of her father, one of our uh, loyal participants in the class, Mrs. Michelle, in honor of her father, memory of her father, of Israel Yitzchak Halevi, Ben Harav Binyamin, who passed away 20 years ago on the 11th of Tevis. Rabbi Irving Levy was a respected Talmud Chacham, a legendary Baal Chesed, and one of the founders of the Munsi community back in 1952. I don't know how many of you have been in Munsi since 1952. The doctor has been there, right? He was an extraordinary figure of Torah and kindness, made weddings for girls who had no one else to help, established careers and life directions for those who were floundering, helped Jews who found themselves in desperate situations and had nowhere else to turn to, and built a beautiful and extraordinary family, and thank you so much for the partnership and dedication. Also dedicated for the Yitzchak Shimshin Ben Herschel. Herschel? Your side today? Should be a good to better for you and the whole family and all of the Jewish people. Your father? Your father? Okay. Thank you, thank you. I once uh, saw a line, I guess you can call it a cynical line. Indifference, indifference will be the downfall of mankind, but who cares? (laughs) I also once saw somebody who wrote, people say, I act as though I don't give a hoot. Idiots, I'm not acting. So, there's an old anecdote about a local news station in some town interviewing a 90-year-old lady because she's just gotten married for the fourth time. So the interviewer asked her questions about her life, what it felt like to get married again at the age of 90. He asked about her new husband's occupation, And she says, my new husband is a funeral director. The newsman thought that was pretty interesting. And he asked her if she wouldn't mind telling him a little bit about her first three husbands and what they did for a living. So she paused for a few moments. She needed some time to compose her thoughts and reflect on all of these years, the last nine decades of her life. And after a short period of time, a smile comes to her face, and she answers proudly to this interviewer, explaining that she first married a banker when she was in her 20s. Then when she was in her 40s, she married a circus ringmaster. In her 70s, she married a preacher. And now in her 90s, she married a funeral director. The interviewer was quite quite astonished. He said, why did you marry four men with such diverse vocations and careers? So she said, and this is how it was printed, I married one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. Okay. (laughs) I begin with these anecdotes today as an intro to uh, a little Jewish trivia question. How many times is the name Moshe, or Moses in English, mentioned in the Torah? Anybody knows? Anybody wants to guess? Huh? You think 10, 20, 50, 60, 70, 100, 200, 300? <laughs> 57? You like 57? Is that the banker or the ringmaster? 
just joking. The answer is 628 times. Hundreds of times more than any other name. There are names mentioned in Chumash. Adam's name, and Chava's name, and Avram's name, and Sarah's name, and Yitzchak's name, and Yaakov, and Yosef. Of course, all these people, and Cain, and Hevel, and, and Paroi, and Aaron, and good people, and villains, and uh, heroes, and noblemen, and aristocrats, and peasants, and righteous people, and not such righteous people. But this name is mentioned hundreds of times more than any other name. A name is usually mentioned once or a few times at most, Never hundreds of times, and here it's 628 times. And there is a good reason for it. The reason for it is because Moshe is the single most central figure in the Torah, and really probably in all of Jewish history. The words of the Chumash, V'loi kam navi bi Yisrael kamoysha sheyidoi Hashem panam al panam. There never arose a prophet like Moshe whom God knew, and he knew God face to face. So this name, Moshe, you will find more than any other name, and not just more, you know, a little more, but as I said, hundreds of times more. And yet, the fascinating thing is, of course, that Moshe was not his real name. I just remember another line a Jew once wrote in a song. He said, the only, knew, the only thing we knew about Bob was that Bob was not his real name. It's the only thing we knew about Bob. Well, Lahavdil, Moshe was given this name years after he was born. Not days, not weeks, not months, but years after he was born. The Torah relates the story in this week's parish of Shmois that Pharaoh's daughter went down to bathe by the Nile Delta, the Nile River. That's when she sees a basket floating among the reeds of the Nile. She opens it and she discovers a little boy, an infant baby, weeping. We know that the little baby was placed there by his mom, his mother, whose name was Yecheved, when he was three months old. The daughter of Pharaoh, whose heart is filled with profound compassion, who also declares when she sees the child crying, This must be a Hebrew child, a Jewish child. And on a literal level, we can understand how she surmised that. On the most basic level, who else would abandon their child here in a basket in the reeds unless a Jewish mother in her last attempt to save this boy from brutally being cast into the Nile Delta? Her heart is filled with compassion. She takes the infant and raises him as a son, as her son, while his biological mother, Yecheved, is nursing him as a result of the brilliant, ingenious negotiation tactics of older sister Miriam. The Torah says, and I quote Exodus 2.10, Shmois Perik Beis Pasek Yud, Vayigdal Hayeled, the child grew up, Vativiyeu Lebas Parai, and the mother who was nursing the baby, who we know is the real mother, brings the baby, brings the boy to the daughter of Pare, and he becomes a son to her, like a stepson. Torah just says a son, a child. And she, the daughter of Pharaoh, gives him a name, and the name is Moshe. Remember, this name is given after the baby is weaned off, after he finishes nursing. And the mother brings her to the daughter of Pari. Yechevet brings her to the daughter of Pari. That's when she gives him a name. Vatoimer, she says, Kimin Hamayim Mishisu. I name him Moshe, for I drew him from the water. I have taken him out. I retrieved him. I drew him from the water. Now, young Moshe must have had a name by then, a few years into his life, a name given to him by his biological Jewish parents, his father or his mother. Yet, in the entire Torah, That name is not mentioned even once. Not only is it not the popular name or the often used name, most often used name, it's not even mentioned once. It only tells us about one single name given by an Egyptian princess, by the daughter of Parai, naming him, as I said, years after his birth. What is more, it's not only a name that was given by her, the name was an Egyptian name. The daughter of Parai 
was not a Hebrew. She was not a Jew. Presumably, she did not speak Lashon HaKodesh, the holy tongue, or she knew the language. It was an Egyptian name that she gave him. The commentators, the Evan Ezra and others, even have a very interesting idea. They say, Min Hamayim Mishisiyu, Mishisiyu is a Hebrew word. If she's giving the name, is she giving the name Moshe for Mishisiyu, which is a Hebrew word? The Evan Ezra says that it's actually the Torah's translation. That's his opinion. It's the Torah's translation of the Egyptian name that she gave. The Torah is translating it into a Hebrew version, which is Moshe. In Hebrew, it would be Moshe, which means to draw out of water. Others actually argue and say, no, this was an Egyptian name that she gave him, which is the literal interpretation. Yes, there are others who argue that she converted and she became close to Judaism and she learned Lashon Kodesh, she learned Hebrew. There are different opinions about this. But on the most basic level, it seems like it was her name and she was an Egyptian princess. Does it then make sense that the greatest Jewish leader in history does not even have a Hebrew name that we would know about from the text of the Tanakh? Now, the Gemara, the Talmud, in Tractate Saita, page 11, records that his mother gave him a name. The name was Tuvia, or others say the name was Toiv. It's hinted to in the verse, after he's born, it says, Vatera Oisai ki Toivhu. She saw that he was Toiv. And the Talmud brings an opinion that that was actually the name she gave him. He's Toiv, good, or Tuvia, which is Tuv Yutke, the goodness of God. The Medrash in Yalkut Shemoni records a name given to him by his father. And that name is Chaver, which means a friend. Chaver from the word Chibur, connection. The Medrash even explains, one explanation, that he is the one who unified his father and his mother who have separated before his birth. Chaver, a friend, both beautiful names. Tuvia, Toiv. Toiv is a good name, pun intended. You think Toiv is a good name? And uh, Chaver is a beautiful name. Yet the Torah ignores these names given to him by his father, Amram, who was considered, as the Rambam says, Gadol Hadar, the spiritual leader or one of the great spiritual giants of the generation, and by his mother, Yechevet, who came from the great tribe of Levi. Instead, it chooses the name of a stranger, somebody who was not related to this child, not only not related, a non-Jewish woman, an Egyptian princess, the daughter of Parai, who gives him an Egyptian name, and besides, a name that's added years after his birth. In fact, the Medrash, Vayikra, Vayikra, Medrash Rabbi Vayikra in the beginning says, Eser Sheimais Nikru Uloy Lamoisha. Moshe actually was given 10 names. Now, how many people know any of these 10 names? Okay, and the Medrash enumerates the 10 names. Yered, Chaver, which I just mentioned from his father, Yukusiel, Avigdor, Avi Soichai, Avi Zanuach. Rabbi Yehuda adds the name I mentioned, Tuvia. Rabbi Shmal adds the name Shmaya. Rabbi Tanchuma adds the name Levi. Those were nine names. Yered, Chaver, you're going to be tested, so make sure you listen. Yered, Chaver, Yukusiel, Avigdor, Avi Soichai, Avi Zanuach, Tuvia. Number eight, Shmaya. Number nine, Levi. Moshe, of course, is the one we all know. You can ask anybody today or till Shabbos, or it's good discussion at the Shabbos table, name three out of Moshe's ten names. Name nine out of Moshe's ten names. We know one name, the last name, given by the non-Jewish daughter of Para years after his birth, an Egyptian name, Moshe. In fact, the Medrash concludes, Amar loy HaKadosh Baruch Hu God told Moshe, Chayecha, I swear to you, I swear to you, Mikol Shemes Shenikru Lecha, Eini Kaira Oischa Ela B'Shem, Shekra Oscha Batya Bas All the names that were given to you by great people, including first and foremost, your mommy and tati, I have chosen one name by which to constantly call you, and that's the name given to you, by the daughter of Paroi, Vatikra Shmai Moshe. And indeed, in the Chumash, we'll have the opening of Leviticus, Vayikra El Moshe. 
Shem called out to Moshe. He always calls him Moshe, Moshe, Vayomer Hineini. That's the name. That's why the Medrash is recorded in the opening of Ayikra, where the Pasuk says, Vayikra al Moshe. And it's even more interesting because Jewish law prohibits to confer on somebody a name or a nickname which may remind them of a challenging past. It's forbidden to give somebody such a name which may be humiliating or denigrating or even aggravating on any level. It's a prohibition in halacha. And yet when it comes to our first and greatest Jewish teacher and Jewish leader, we call him not by his Jewish name, but by his Egyptian name, which forever reminds everybody that this boy grew up in the home of Pare and he was named by the monarch's daughter. So how are we to, how are we to really really understand this. Now, there's no question that Pare's daughter is to be remembered forever in great fondness as she is because she saved. She saved this boy. We understand that. But why would her name reign supreme and completely, not obliterate, but completely cast such a powerful shadow and eclipse, literally eclipse every single other name, especially those that were given by his bris, or even before Moshe Rabbeinu was born, the Gemara says he was Noilad Mol, he was born circumcised, so uh, the bris was a little bit of a different nature, we call it Hatafas Dam Bris, there is something done, but it's done differently, and uh, I have somebody in uh, my father's family who was born also that way, after a bris, and they were born on Zion Adar, my uncle, he was born Zion Adar, the same birthday of Moshe Rabbeinu, <laughs> And my grandfather, my father's father, was a moil, so it was a different type of bris. You do let out a little blood, it's like a prick, but the circumcision was done already. It's done by, uh, by God. The boy, my uncle, was born uh, like after a bris, literally, completely. So that's fascinating. So it's not just a phenomenon uh, that's discussed in the books. It, uh, it's a reality. And the fascinating thing is the date of his birth. So whenever they gave him a name, but they gave him a name certainly close to his birth. Now, another fascinating thing is when you look through the Chumash, baby names are very significant. I mean, look who gives them. The names are given either usually by the mother, sometimes by the father, or by Hashem himself. When you look at the name Avraham, it was changed from Avram to Avram by Hashem, Sarai to Sarah by Hashem, Yitzchak was a name chosen by Hashem, Vikarasa Shema Yitzchak. Yaakov was a name chosen by, by, by his father. Some say by God. All the names of the Shvatim were given by the mothers. Leah was given. And there was profound significance. Each one of the great heroes and the founding fathers and mothers of the Jewish people were given by either the biological, usually the mother, sometimes the father and Hashem himself. And yet Moshe, Neither. His mother gave him a name, but we don't talk about it. His father gave him a name, but for that you have to search in the Medrash and you'll find in one or two places that name very rarely known and not mentioned in the written text of Torah anywhere. But it's actually here that we uh, can deduce an extraordinary, profound perspective that the Torah conveys through this very choice of the name. Why was this name so precious to God? Why does God say, I swear that from all the names, this is the only name I'm going to call you by? It certainly should be appreciated that she gave him a name. But why does this name not only reign supreme, but literally eclipse anything else? It must be that there's something here so significant and so vital that it's like lighting a candle. The Gemara says when you light a candle in the middle of the sun, in the, middle of, in the presence of sunlight, it, uh, it loses its power. Shraga betiara mayahani. To light a candle in the middle of the day. You light a candle at night, it's very significant. But in the middle of the day, it's just eclipsed by the momentous and powerful light of the sun. And one, one perspective, one possible explanation for this, there are more but one, emerges quite clearly as we follow the story of this child who grows up. Because in the next scene, she raises him as a son, she names him Moshe, and then in the following verses, the same Exodus chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, Shmois Beis, Yud Beis, Yud Gimel, Vayhi Bayamim Harabim Ahim. It happened in those days, Vayigdal Moshe. Moshe grows up. 
It already said he grew up once, but as Rashi says, the first time he grew up, Harishan Lakaima, Hasheni Ligdullah, the first time he grew up was more physical. He reached a, a greater stature in terms of physical height and development, and that's when his mother gave him to the daughter of Pare. But now, Vayigdal Moshe says, Mino Pare al Besai, Pare appointed him on his home. In other words, it was a different type of development. Vayetse al Echav. He goes out to his brothers. And that's the first story we know about Moshe. There's no other story before that. Till now he's been passive, meaning he's been placed in a casket by his mother who's trying to desperately save his life so he shouldn't be cast into the delta with so many other Jewish male infants. He has been nursed by his mother. He's been brought to the daughter of Para. He has been named, but he's not an active participant in these stories. He is a child who is receiving a benefactor. He's recipient of the of the benevolence and kindness, of course, of his sister and his mother and his new stepmother. But what's the first story about him? The first words about him is he grew up, he went out to his brethren, to his brothers. And we all know the first encounter, he sees their agony, he sees their burdens, he sees their pain. Particularly, he encounters and becomes an observer of one scene. Vayar ish mitzri maka ish ivri me'echav. He sees an Egyptian man who's striking a Hebrew man, one of his brothers. Vayifen koi v'choi, vayar kiyein ish, vayaches ha-mitzri vayitmenehu b'chayl. That's the quote of the Pasuk. Moshe turns here and he turns there. He sees there was no man. He struck the Egyptian down and hid him in the sand. The Torah continues the story, he goes out the second day, he sees two Jews fighting with each other, and when he asks a person, one Jew, why would you strike and beat up your friend? The person says, are you going to kill me the way you killed the Egyptian? Who indeed made you a judge, a prince, a minister, somebody to tell us and discipline us and guide us. Vayira Moshe, Moshe is terrified and he says, Ah, what happened yesterday has been become known. And indeed, as the Torah continues, Parai receives the news about what his daughter's stepson has done. An informer spread the story. Pharaoh the king has heard of the event. And Vayivake Shamisai. He summons Moshe to be executed. He's ready to execute his own daughter's stepson for treason. Moshe is then forced to flee. Vayivrach, he flees to another country, to a country called Midian, where he would go to the well and ultimately meet his own wife, Tzipira. And the story goes on as it continues to move on in Midian, the burning bush, the flock, until he would one day come back to Egypt. Now, I'd like for a moment to analyze with you the background to this story. If this is the opening story about Moshe Rabbeinu, if this is the first story, it means it's not just a story that happened, it's profoundly significant. We don't know so many stories about his youth. In fact, there's only this story that's told, a second story that's told when two Jews are fighting, how he intervenes. And then one more story that's told about how he protects Yisrael's seven daughters who are being persecuted and harassed by the shepherds in Midian. Those are the three stories that we know about Moshe pre to his selection and choice by the Rebbeinu Shalom and by Hashem to become the leader of the Jewish people. But this is the first. He grew up in Egypt. As we have seen, he grew up in the palace of Pharaoh, by the princess, by Batya. It's interesting that the Torah does not name her, doesn't name her, just says the daughter of Pare. That's also significant. It's only in Chronicles, in Divrei Hayamim, the book of Divrei Hayamim 1, chapter 4, where Pare's daughter is named Bisya, Bitya, or sometimes pronounced Batya, or Basya. And our sages identify that Bisya, or that Batya, with the daughter of Pare in the beginning of Shmois. But in Chumash, it actually doesn't say her name. We don't know who she is. We just know that she's Pare's daughter. I guess that's the key to understand the profundity and extraordinary components of the story. But Moshe was living in luxury. He was living in prosperity. He was living in tranquility when the daughter of Pharaoh, the most powerful monarch of the time, and living in the monarch of a superpower, 
she was his daughter and she raised him as a son. So basically, the Egyptian monarchy has been kind to this young Hebrew lad, far kinder than anyone else of his kin, his age, growing up as a persecuted slave hunted down. The entire Jewish nation, in contrast, was being oppressed, persecuted. Egyptian taskmasters, as the Torah makes clear, would regularly be Jews. They were slave laborers. This was the status of the Jewish people, as the Torah makes it clear, and the Midrashim even elaborate in great detail. So basically, the entire Egypt turned into a gigantic concentration camp for the Jewish people. What Moshe saw that day, an Egyptian beating a Jew, sadly, was the routine. This was just another day in Egyptian society during that horrible time. Moshe, who's an Egyptian prince, and here we come to an interesting question. At this time, did he know he was Jewish? The Evan Ezra says he didn't know he was Jewish. Vayetze el Echov doesn't mean Jewish brothers. It means Egyptian brothers. He went out of the palace to see Egyptian society. And that's when he saw an Egyptian beating up a Jew. The Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, Nachman, it differs with the Evan Ezra. It says Vayetze el Echov means he went out to his brothers. He has been notified by somebody, perhaps by Batya, perhaps by somebody else, that he was Jewish. But it's very possible, as Devin Ezra and other commentators say at this point, he didn't even know he was Jewish. Regardless, the Torah leaves it a little ambiguous, although you, many would say his brothers would mean his Jewish brothers, but as, as, as I'm sharing, the commentators themselves argue about it. He goes out and when he sees this Jew being beaten, he kills an Egyptian officer while protecting a Hebrew slave. That would be an act of treason, towards the king, who happens to be his step-grandfather, no less. And indeed, we see Parai now wants his head for doing this. He's family. He is his daughter's stepson. But treason is treason. You are here rebelling against the king himself. You're killing an Egyptian officer who works for the king in order to slave to save, to rescue a slave who's beaten. But let's now think about Moshe's perspective. If at least something substantial can be gained here, I can understand. But what did Moshe think he stands to gain by killing one Egyptian officer when an entire nation is being enslaved by a brutal, sadistic, genocidal regime? who has no qualms taking every newborn male infant and literally casting it into that beautiful, magnificent Nile Delta, the longest or the second to the longest river in, on, on our planet, extending more than 4,000 miles, a nation that is being worked, beaten, persecuted, harassed, killed mercilessly. Even this Jew himself, how long will he survive? He may not be killed today, he may be beaten or killed tomorrow, the next day, the next week, the next month. But, isn't there something far more at stake in this act of Moshe Rabbeinu? And, allow me to analyze this with you at a moment. Moshe was a stepson, a step-grandson of Parai, growing up in the palace. He was raised as a beloved child in aristocracy. Knowing what would become of Moshe later, this year is 2020. So it's a year of 2020 vision. Right? That's the year, the year of vision, of clarity, of seeing things 2020. But there's always Monday morning quarterback. What do we say? In hindsight, everybody has 2020 vision. The novelty is to have 2020 vision as the year begins, not in hindsight. But what we know, let's be that Monday morning quarterback. We know what happens of Moshe. We know the end of the story. We're not there at the beginning of the story. We're there in the aftermath of the story. We can infer that Parai, who was a very successful king and powerful king, and his daughter were absolutely enamored by this talented, brilliant, noble, 
charismatic, heroic, fearless, wise, humble, and humble is a key word, and majestic figure. The man who we would discover later changed the world. As the Gemara says in Brachas 48, Butzin, Butzin, Mekat Yediyah, genius you always see in the child. The prodigy you see in the child. What happens in the future you will see as in a child. Moshe didn't emerge from a vacuum. Moshe was a unique child. The Gemara says when he was born, she saw he was good. What was good? The whole house. The whole house was filled with light. In fact, Rashi himself quotes the Medrash. It says, Moshe grew up and he went out to his brothers. What does it mean he grew up? Paray took this young lad and he made him the person in charge on his entire palace. Pari was no dummy. You don't do away with such talent, with such brilliance, with such prowess, with such charisma, with such wisdom, when it is in your midst. This boy is being groomed for leadership, and Pari knew it. Vayigdal Moshe, he became great. Rashi says it on the spot, right before the story of him going out to his brothers and watching the beating. He became the CFO, or the CEO, if you will, over Paray's palace. Now, he was a young man at the time. He was a young man, but Paray understood this. It rem- it's reminiscent of Yosef, who is Paitifar, Paray's servant, recognizes his greatness, and he makes him again in charge of the entire home, as the king himself would later turn Yosef into the prime minister. These people, you got to give them credit, they know who to hire. And that's the key. You don't have to be smart yourself. You just got to know how to surround yourself with smart people. Much better than being smart. You have the cake and you eat it too. Because if you're smart, you become sensitive and life gets hard. But if you just know how to surround yourself with smart people, then you could remain dumb. You get the cake and you eat it too and let them make the right decisions. Of course, present company excluded. But the concept is clear. Paray knows who to hire. Poitifar knew how to hire, that Pari knew how to hire, this Pari knows how to hire. Some people say it's even the same, but even if it's not the same, depends how you interpret Melech Chodosh, according to Rav Shmuel. And therefore this man was being, this kid was being groomed for leadership. In all likelihood, if you were to observe this, you know, fly on the wall, or some uh, servant in the palace, and you would observe this, what would be the trajectory that you would see Moshe, and his stepmother and his step-grandfather following, it would be clear that Moshe, in all likelihood, or at least there was great probability, he might one day become an ear to Paray, or at least one of the dominant, influential, leading figures of Egypt. If this is true, and it's certainly to be inferred from the way the story is told and understood, if you were now in Moshe's position, with this trajectory and destiny in mind, and you observed this horrific fact of a Jew being beaten by an Egyptian general or commander or soldier or taskmaster or legion, what would you have done? And I think about it, try objectively and honestly, but with compassion. Using my rational logic, I might have thought to myself, Shut your mouth, stay put, make believe your heart is not being torn to pieces. Keep your anger, your horror, and your disbelief to yourself. Let this Egyptian get away with his crime. You may even be smart, smiling to him and complimenting him on what a good job he did. These monsters are doing this regularly. This entire regime is rotten to its core, which the ten plagues would later bring out, but they would just bring out what is happening. The first plague is that the Nile becomes blood. Now, people often don't realize the irony of that. It's not just a punishment that there's no water. It's just all the ten makas. I'm saying this in parentheses, so it's not our topic, but all the ten today, all the ten makos are really a physical manifestation 
of the moral decadence of the society. Because till today, tourists go to the Nile all the time. It's one of the most beautiful and extraordinary attractions in the world. It's a beautiful delta. I told you it goes through, I think, 11 countries. The Nile cuts through 11 countries and extends almost 5,000 miles. The longest or the second to the longest river in the world. And in many places, it is so beautiful. Have you ever been at the Nile? You heard about the Nile. You could say, see pictures and videos. Calm, beautiful, spr- sparkling blue water. In fact, the Egyptian Nile was a world-renowned phenomenon because once a year, It would flood. Egypt has no rain or very little rain. And it survived because the Nile would flood the soil of Egypt. And the water was so vibrant, so fresh, so clear and so healthy, it allowed Egypt and ancient Egypt to become one of the most powerful economies. First of all, all the fish that it attracted, diverse fish, um, uh, the papyrus, the papyrus business, the vegetation and produce was extraordinary, all because of the Nile. So now imagine the scene. Egyptians, it's 12 o'clock midday, and Egyptian aristocrats and noblemen want to go to the beach. That's what you do on a nice sunny day. Now I know it's January. I don't mean to bring up nostalgia of June, July, and August, although I personally don't mind winter so much. I think coldness is sometimes good for the soul. But it's a beautiful day in Egypt in the Middle East, and the Egyptian noblemen and women go to the Nile, and they have their beach chairs, right? And they're on their chairs right there in front of the Nile, enjoying the beautiful, beautiful water, the atmosphere, the ambiance, the calmness. They're either drinking a latte or a nice coffee, maybe somebody having a screwdriver or a pina colada. They're reading the newspaper. This is before cell phones. They're reading the newspaper and they're enjoying the calm, serene, cultural richness that Egypt has to offer. But this blue Nile Delta is eclipsing a secret. And what's the secret? The secret is that if you would go down, what would you find? You would find babies, corpses, who to the cry of their mothers and fathers and siblings, and to the cry of the babies, maybe in the middle of the night, were cast into that Nile with such unfathomable brutality and sadism. And then by day, the Feinschmeckers and the aristocrats are enjoying the Nile. When that water became blood, It was just a statement that reality will ultimately reveal its true colors. That's what reality does. The word reality always does that. After all, if it's real, it's going to emerge. Reality. It's blood. It's a bloody river. This is a river of blood. But, as Winston Churchill said during the Second World War, when many rivers flowed with blood, quite literally, that in a time of war, the truth is so precious, it must be protected by bodyguards of lies. So Moshe might have thought to himself, smile to this Egyptian monster and say, job well done. After all, this entire society has lost its humanity. This entire society has descended into the moral abyss. Look at what they're doing day in, day out. This is one Jew. This Jew is sadly just one tiny example of what's going on in mass, day in and day out. You, Moshe, remain the loyal, dutiful, dedicated Egyptian priest, at least on the outside, Play the game. Remain dedicated to your grandfather, the most powerful person in this country and in the world. Slowly but surely, you climb the ranks of politics, diplomacy, family intrigue and relationships. Play the game of politics. Prove your efficiency and your loyalty. Loyalty first, efficiency second. And if you play this game of chess correctly, 
one day, maybe not so far down the road, you know what happens? You might be sitting on that throne. You might become the successor. And you know what you will do then? You won't save one Jew. You won't save one Jew who's being beaten and who may die from his wounds tomorrow or may be beaten tomorrow by somebody else. And probably another 10 soldiers, when they discover what happened, will come and take revenge on him and another 10 Jews. You know who you will save? You will save hundreds and thousands of Jews. Men, women, and children, if they went out with 600,000 males between 20 and 60, plus females, plus children, plus senior citizens, you're dealing with two or three or four million people. Allow me to give an illustration to this thinking and go to another chapter in history, but one not very long ago. And that is, imagine it's 1942. There is a young lad, good-looking, seems Aryan, blue-eyed, muscular, handsome, tall, beautiful, athletic. And this young person has been chosen to become part of Adolf Hitler, Yemach Shemai's inner circle. Hitler places this young man in charge of what was known as the Burghof. The Burghof was Hitler's home in the Bavarian Alps. Have you ever seen pictures of the Burghof? Extraordinary location in terms of landscape and nature. And this lad, this young, talented, efficient person who is in charge on the Burghof Palace, sees a scene. An SS guard, an SS soldier, has caught the Jew. He's beating this Jew. He's beating this Jew to death. Here is a choice you have to make. You can kill this SS guard. And you'll save the Jew for how long? Five minutes? 60 seconds? 10 minutes? Maybe a few days? Maybe a few weeks? Maybe a few months? If he manages to hide somewhere until he's caught, what happens next? Your true colors emerge. The man who feigned loyalty to Nazism is himself, a fafluchte teyude, a cursed Jew. Hitler would have you executed immediately. Alternatively, wouldn't it be rational and sensitive For this hidden Jew to think to himself, let me turn a blind eye to the beating as difficult as it is. Let me be honest, this brutality has been going on for years now. It's affecting not one Jew, it's affecting all of European Jewry. It's affecting the world, it's affecting tens of millions of innocent people. Taking down one Nazi will not end the Holocaust. Taking down this SS guard beating a Jew will not end the Second World War. Will not destroy the camps, the death camps, the gas chambers. You think to yourself, but what happens if I play my game correctly? If I play my game correctly, look where I am. I could be promoted. Higher levels, higher levels. And what if one day I'll be promoted as the ear, or at least as one of the very influential figures. And what if one day I will be the successor? I won't save one Jew. I will put an end to the genocide. I will save millions of Jews who are still alive. We must admit, there is rationality in this thought. We call it, we have very beautiful words for it, long-term vision, long-term planning, bite your lips, Don't think of your own horror, but think of the greater good. Think of numbers. Think about all of this. And Moshe is not fantasizing. One bright day, maybe I'll have some power. You have already become the CEO of this man, of this tyrant's palace. You're climbing those ranks. You're doing well. Shut your mouth. Smile, make believe you didn't see much. Yes, if you want to cry, cry in your bedroom when nobody sees. You must play a game, a dishonest game, a game of deception, 
in order to save not one, but to save a nation. But we all know that's not what Moshe did. It's what he could have done. It's, I think, what would make sense on some level. He chose a very different path. He didn't hesitate for a moment. He didn't go think. He didn't meditate. He didn't reflect. What did he do? Without hesitation, he cut down the life of the SS guard. He killed the Egyptian. The Medrash Rabbah quotes three opinions how he killed him. We all know what Rashi says. How did he kill him? Shem HaMafayrish, right? What they didn't teach us is that in Medrash, there are another two opinions. Rashi is quoting the third. The first opinion is, Be'eg Reifa, he used his fist. The second opinion is, Magreifa Shaltit. This Jew was shoveling cement. He took that shovel and killed the Egyptian. The third opinion is, B'Shem HaMafayrish, he used God's name. Either opinion, this man was dead. He cut down his life right there, right then, took his body and hid it in the sand to eclipse evidence as long as possible. At that moment, what happened? He didn't only cut down the life of a murderer. He destroyed his entire dream. He destroyed his entire glorious potential. Not only would he not become the king of Egypt, he would become an outlawed fugitive. He would run away from his stepmother, from his stepfather, from the palace, from the land. He would have to abandon his own family, his mother and father, running for his life without a roof over his head, ending up at a well, desperate for bread and protection, because now all he is is a fugitive who the most powerful person would pay a lot for his head. And somebody might turn to this young man and ask this question, Moshe, where is your long-term planning skills? What happened with vision? Had you just kept quiet, you would have achieved so much more in terms of nobility, morality, kindness, chesed, compassion, pikuach nefesh. Sure, this Jew would have died, I know that. But down the line, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, even 30 years, maybe 35 years, when Parai kicks the bucket, when Parai breathes his last, you become the new boss, or at least significantly powerful to advise the new boss, and you change everything. Isn't it worth it? And you know what, Moshe? Even if you'll never become the boss, you have a step-uncle who will never allow you to do this. Okay. Let's say even if your stepmother won't get you in a second in command, but you will certainly remain a prominent figure in Paris' inner circle. You can certainly yield much more influence when you're all the way on the top than when you're a fugitive in Midian. Let's say you're not the king, but as a very powerful person, you can help here, help there, achieve this, manipulate this, exploit this from a powerful place in the government. You can achieve a tremendous amount and one might turn to him and say, had you just restrained yourself, had you just shown a little more patience and restraint in a few years, you would have been rewarded the Nobel Prize for Peace. You would have been, you would have gone down in history as the legend who ended the genocide. You would have become a household name in history for the way you transformed that sadistic regime. You would have been credited with ending the Egyptian genocide. Instead, in a moment of ire, you lost this opportunity for the rest of your life. You are a homeless refugee. Nobody will ever hear your name again. And you didn't allow yourself to win a Nobel Prize for peace. Makes sense, right? But it's not what happened. And I guess it's good Moshe didn't ask me. Or at least ask this rational-minded expert before he did it. 
Moshe was brilliant. If I can understand this calculation, he certainly could have also. He did not heed this calculation. You know why? Because he saw a Jew being beaten to death. In the face of such brutality, he could not respond otherwise. He simply did not have the ability to respond differently. All the logic in the world went flying out the window as he saw the scene of an innocent person being tortured to death. He struck the murderer and buried him in the sand. And this, paradoxically, is what made Moshe who he was. This brought to the fore who this person was. His love for humanity, his love for his people, his love for truth, his love for justice, his love for compassion. It was seared, not into his logic, it was seared into the very core of his being. It was woven into the very texture of his mind, of his soul, of his heart, into every genome of his DNA into every cell of his 40 trillion cells. It was burning a glow in every fiber of his neshama. Of course, Moshe was not trying to be irresponsible and get caught. That's not the point. He tried ensuring that no one was looking. He looked there. He looked there. Of course, he did not want to get caught. Of course, he hid the body. But he did not allow cold logic, even if rational, to keep him safe and distant while allowing a Jew to die. What's even more astounding is when we open a medrash and we find out who this Jew was. Who was this Jew being beaten? So the medrash rabbi tells us this Jew was no great saint. In fact, his name becomes very well known in the history of Chumash. His name was Dasan. Dasan is considered one of the most infamous Jewish troublemakers in the Egypt and in the desert who did not stop rebelling against the man who gave everything up to save his life. Rashi tells the story, the Medrash tells the story, Dasan had a wife, she was no saint herself. There was an Egyptian who went to have relations with her and her husband noticed it and realized it and that's why he was beating him. It was this Jew with profound moral flaws who later would become an enemy of Moshe. Now imagine, how could somebody hate the person who saved your life even if you disagree with him? Doesn't this tell you about Dasan? He was some tzatzke, as your grandmother would say. And he say tzatzke in English. Uh, he was some, uh, some more, some, uh, call it some chutzpah, audacity this man had. And for him, Moshe sacrificed his entire future his entire life. Paradoxically, is Moshe's name remembered. It's this quality in Moshe, which not only did it not derail his success to save his people, it turned him into the most well-known human being in history, not only in the Jewish world, even in the non-Jewish world. A man who changed history, not only of the Jewish people, but of the world. In fact, it's a fascinating fact. Every movement in history dedicated to free slaves, including in our times, whether it's Martin Luther King Jr. or in generations ago, the abolish movement in the United States trying to abolish slavery. And any movement in history, or almost any movement in history that I've read about dedicated to free slaves will always say their hero is one man, Moses. They always glean inspiration and guidance from Moses. Had Moshe done nothing, had he would have, it would have used the logical calculations, his name would have been added to the endless list of noblemen who lived, died, and their bodies became fodder for the worms. It was precisely the single act of fanatical devotion to justice, compassion, love, and truth 
the single act of courage and resolve which turned him into the man who would later confront the para, subdue him, emancipate the oppressed people, and triggering the entire march of history towards freedom. Paradoxically, it was this illogical, impulsive, quote-unquote, or seemingly impulsive act, which most would say this doesn't make sense. You're not being rational. It's because of that Moshe becomes a fugitive. But who takes down Parai? Moshe. Who liberates all of the people, the millions of people? Moshe. And who introduces the vocabulary of human freedom into the vocabulary of mon- mankind? This man, Moshe. All the names given to Moshe, all the names given to Moshe were Hebrew names. None of them could convey his true sacrifice, and why he was chosen by the Creator to change the vocabulary of humanity. These are beautiful names. Divinely inspired names, perhaps. Darizal says every parent, when they give a name, there's a Nevu Akhtana, little Ruach HaKadosh, divine inspiration that flows through Mami and Tati when they choose the name of a child, which is why it's pretty senseless when grandparents get upset I don't like this name and I don't like that name. You should have given this name to the point that sometimes I observe families like real disputes for years. A grandmother is upset at the grandchild as though it's his fault because his father chose the name that she didn't want. I don't know where people get this arrogance and pettiness to be able to sacrifice what is important and not trust not tr- if a name is so significant, it's only significant because Torah says it's significant. And the same Torah says that parents are given the divine inspiration. Not the Zayda, not the Baba, not the uncle, not the aunt. It's a wonderful thing if you want to consult your parents and grandparents, but to turn it into a personal affront, I think, is senseless. In any case, these are great names, extraordinary names given by Ruach HaKadosh. But none of them convey the real story of Moshe. It's one name that conveys the story, the Egyptian name, given by an Egyptian princess, years after he's born, in the palace of Paroi. It's this name that captures the magnitude of a story. He was an Egyptian prince. He had an Egyptian name. He was a stepson of the daughter of Paroi. She saw him as her son, that's why she named him, and therefore as his ear. It's this man who could have joined the pantheon of Egyptian demigods and exercised full power over their subjects. And yet, in a single moment of truth, he said goodbye to all of this because right now he could save one Jewish life from death. And it's that passion and it's that infinite courage that set him apart. Yes, mathematically, There's a lot to say about this, but that's exactly what Moshe was not. He was not a mathematician of justice. He was not a philosopher of monotheism. He was not an expert on social rights. And he was not a political scientist of the highest degree. He was all of the above too. But that's not what made Moshe Moshe. What made Moshe Moshe was that when he saw such cruelty, he could not ignore it he could not every fiber of his being protested it that passion for truth that passion for godliness that passion for holiness that passion for justice that passion for love was absolute it was infinite in fact rabbi Evadia sifarno brings out a magnificent point and that is it's not just an egyptian name it's also the nature of the name What is the nature of the name? I drew him out of water. Why would she give him that name? It's a fascinating story. I drew him out of water. I found him in the water. But why did she choose that moment as a name? People often give names for many different reasons. A name that they love, a name of their family, a name that is very dear to them, maybe an event that's dear to them. Batya chose this name. But look how she chose it. As the Mepharshim say, grammatically, she should have named him Moshui. Moshui is the one drawn out of water. Moshe, 
really means something else. Masha means to he, he pulls out others of the water. So she named him wrongly. She should have named him Mashri, the one who was pulled out of the water. That's the story. Mashri is the right name. Pulled out. Masha is a mafil. It's what you do for somebody else. Masha min amayim. He pulled out of water. He didn't pull out of water. He was pulled out of water. But the daughter of Pare here planted an extraordinary seed in Moshe's life and in Moshe's soul, which is why God says, this is the name I'm going to choose. You see, in many ways, when Moshe stood there watching this Jew beaten to death, and his mind might have said, let him die, let him be wounded, we think about the big picture. We got to change systems. We don't change individuals. Yeah? We change systems, which they will teach you when you go to great seminars, right? They'll always teach you don't get stuck in small stuff. We change systems. The moment you change systems, out is good. Don't invest in the eggs, invest in the chicken. Because all the eggs come from the chicken. Moshe, this Jew is an egg. Let's go to the chicken. Don't deal with symptoms. Deal with root causes. Now this is all good language. Very good language. But in sometimes, this is cruel language. Misplaced language. Because remember, all noble language depends on context. In one context... This is beautiful language, logical, thought out, successful, effective people go to the root. They go to systems. But sometimes, in a different context, it's narcissistic language, or at least it's wrong language. It's misplaced justice. When Moshe was looking at this moment, he had a flashback, conscious or subconscious. And it didn't have to be subconscious because it was his name. And what was the flashback? Many years ago, not so long ago, many years ago, there was another Jewish boy. His life was also in danger. And a woman, not Jewish, saw him. What should have been her calculation logically? What are the chances that her father is going to say, Hey, Batyala, what's new? And Batya would say, Tati, I went to the Nile today, and I saw this cute, adorable Boy, Mamesh Amalach. I couldn't resist him. And you know what? I'm raising him in the palace. Now think Stalin's daughter. Think Hitler's daughter. It would be a mess if she came out live from such an encounter. Batya, you don't do this. Shut your lips. Go home. Take your father to therapy. Do Pilates every day with him. Yoga, anger management. Let's get to his traumas. Let's put him on vitamins. Okay, maybe a little acupuncture would be very beneficial for him. Let's work on him. Let's stabilize him. Let's make him like himself more. And then he'll like other people more. That's what you do, Batya. Change systems. You're going to save a little kid. So you saved one kid. You know how many hundreds of thousands are there, down there, drown? Batya. Seichel. Seichel. In fact, and here you see, I say to you often that medrash to the text is harmony to the song. Everybody knows that Pasuk in Shmois. Batya sees a basket. Vatishlach es amosa. She sends amosa. Literally, it means her maidservant to retrieve the basket from the reeds. But instead of saying shivchasa, her maidservant, a very different word is used. Amosa. So the sages come and they give a different interpretation. Amosa comes from the word ama. Ama is a measurement which is approximately a foot and a half, which is basically the measurement of the hand. Vatishlach es amosa. She stretched out her arm to retrieve the basket. Now the problem is, why would the Torah use such a weird, strange term, amasa, vatishlach es yada, her hand. And what do Chazal say about this in the Medrash, you remember? Nishtar yeah, yeah. yada amos harbe. 
Her hand suddenly was extended many feet, five feet, ten feet, twenty feet, until she can reach the basket. Now I ask you, why would the Medrash do this to this story? Like, isn't this story good enough without this? Like, why impose a new miracle? The greatest miracle is that she did it. Her hand, her maid, and is it really relevant how she did it? She got it. She sent somebody. She went, she went to bathe. Maybe she went herself. It's a pastor's for her royal highness. So she sent somebody. A whole new miracle. Her hand extended many feet. And as somebody once asked me, he said to me, a very interesting question. He said, Rabbi Jacobson, you know, when I read these madrashim, it actually distances the Torah from me. Because it's like, it says, okay, it doesn't relate to you. <laughs> when I stretch out my hand, it doesn't get extended. Somehow. So, okay, miracles are happening everywhere. It doesn't relate to me. What I explained to him was that it's the contrary. The Medrash is not trying to give a new story. It's trying to tell you the story. It's giving you the harmony of the story. You could read stories, like hear a song, and not get the full resonance of it. But when you put in the harmony, what does harmony do? It doesn't change the song. It doesn't make a new song. What does it do, harmony? It enhances it. It accentuates it. You know that the Japanese eat watermelon with salt? You know that? You know why? Because salt actually brings out the taste of the watermelon. Now, I'm not telling you to do this at home. I don't know if Friday night if your kids are going to enjoy watermelon with salt. But you could try it yourself if you want. Sometimes you have to be Japanese to appreciate these things. No, because if you grow up in a certain culture, your taste buds are sensitive to things. Americans don't always know the difference of salt and other spices. Zalts, more salt, more salt, less salt, more salt. You have to have sophisticated taste buds. I'm not a connoisseur on this. But the point is, the salt brings it out. Lahavdil, the medrash, the harmony brings out the song. They're trying to tell you the story. And it's one of the most powerful images that are appropriate for the story. What our sages are telling about the story is, Batya reached her arm. Can that arm, can my arm reach the basket? No. Which means, when Batya was asking herself this question, can this story end in success? The answer is, no. It can't, it can't. Batya, this is a bad story. My advice, ignore. Shut your lips. It's painful. Let's change systems. We invest in chickens, not in eggs. You really feel bad? Take the baby, okay? Send them away. Bribe an Egyptian family. A couple of extra money. Or give some extra money. Let them raise. Fine. Seichel. You're taking him. Your father is the man who wants to see every Jewish kid dead. You're going to die. Or at least you'll become his arch enemy. He'll throw you out of the palace. And you know your father is not playing with a full deck of cards. And even if he is, his brutality knows no bounds if he can bathe in the blood of Egyptian children, of Jewish children. This hand cannot reach the basket. But what does she do? She does it. Because her perspective in life is, there is a baby here who will die from hunger, from starvation, from an Egyptian coming and capsizing the basket and throwing him into the delta, or from neglect. That's the reality. I cannot ignore this. And what happens? What happens is when you stretch out your hand, God often does the rest. That makes the story more relevant because so often I say, my hand can't do this. I can go till here. I'm not an angel. I'm not a superhuman being. When Moshe looked at this moment of this Jew being beaten, he has a flashback. His stepmother should have said the same thing. Think big, think big, think big. And then he looked into himself and he realized he has a name. What's his name? Masha. He takes people out of water. His stepmother was reminding him something. What was done to you 
must become the destiny of your life. When you see such a situation, don't think big. Think life, death, truth. Don't become a mathematician. And Moshe responds. The name is not Moshui. I was taken out of water. I was taken out of water so I can take others out of water. And it's true in every person's life. Some people have been through difficult challenges in life. Your greatest healing happens when you discover that everything you have been through is ultimately there for you to be able to help others with similar challenges who can only be helped by somebody who can understand and empathize and experience what they have experienced. Sure, nobody can judge anybody if they live most of, most of their life feeling bad for themselves and demonizing their perpetrator. And there is room for that and important to have compassion and to bring perpetrators to justice. No question about that. But your ultimate growth and healing always happens when I could look at myself and say, I know what this person has been through like nobody else. And therefore, I will become an ambassador who will draw them out of the waters like I have been by the grace of people and by the grace of God been drawn out of water. When you turn your pain into a source of leadership, you become the most powerful leader in the world. When you turn your own crises, your own skeletons, your own trauma, your own loneliness into a force for goodness, that force is unstoppable. That force has such a might and ferociousness to it, like the raging water, because it converts all of that negative energy into leadership. So years later, Moshe knows, I can't ignore a Jewish man being beaten, just as I was not ignored. Moshe, Moshe, the very name, drawn out of water would not allow him to rest. An Egyptian princess sacrificed her life to save me. She was also in the palace, and she was not a stepson. She was a biological daughter. And she did it. I will now say, no, 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 I have a position in the palace. Which is why the Medrash says that Hashem told Batya something incredible. He said to her, you have taken somebody who is not your child and made him your child. I will take you and make me my child. Batya is Bat Yudke, the daughter of God. That's very profound. Moshe was not your child. You had all the rights in the world to say, he's not mine. It's part of a Jewish problem. I care for him, but I care for everybody. You didn't do that. You made him, you made Moshe your child. I take you. You're the daughter of Pare. Most people would not call you God's child. At best, they would call you Pare's daughter. But I call you Batia. Moshe became your child. You become my child. That's what she accomplished. That's the significance of the name Moshe. The significance of the name Basia. Then Moshe understood. What if this Jew being beaten was his child? Would he also make those calculations? All my calculations I made, my brilliant calculations before. Play chess. Climb the ranks. 30 years you'll become the, you'll become the king. What if it's your child? Somehow, all these mathematics will go flying out the window. Why? Not because you're dumb. Because it's your child. The urgency of the matter eclipses everything else. And not because you're stupid. But because you're real. Because you're a mother. Because you're a father. That's what she did for Moshe, who was not her child. God says, and that way... You became my child, Batya. In 1973, there was a fellow named John Darley and Daniel Batson. They were two psychologists from Princeton University. And they conducted 
a social experiment inspired by the well-known story in non-Jewish circles, the story of the Good Samaritan. It's a very well-known story from the religion of Christianity. And basically, it tried to demonstrate that religious Jews were socially corrupt, which was the ancient Christian way of demonizing Jews who stuck to the Torah versus the Jews, the Jewish sect which left Judaism and developed into this new religion that became known as the Good Samaritan. Some of you are familiar with Good Samaritan for other reasons, but that's where it comes from. Okay, but I don't think too many people know the connection. So basically, in that story, there was a lone traveler. He's been beaten, and he's been left dead by robbers on the road between Jerusalem and Jericho. This lone traveler was left for dead. He wasn't left dead, he was left for dead. And both a priest and a Levite, a Kayan and a Levi, two religiously pious and morally upright Jews from the Pharisees, from the religious Jews, come upon the helpless man on separate occasions and nobody has time to assist him. And finally, there's a Samaritan man. He's a member of what was a socially despised group and a socially unclean sect of people in Jewish culture. He comes on the scene, he bounds up his wounds and he takes him to an inn to rest and heal. This is the very despicable story of the Good Samaritan. It's 1973. These two Princeton psychologists, Darley and Batson, they meet, listen to this, with a group of Princeton theological seminary students, mostly Christians, and they they ask half of these theologically training students to prepare a short talk on employment opportunities for divinity students after graduation. This is what their talk should be. And the other half of students, they should prepare a talk on the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's a parable, but they should give a presentation on it. So he takes a group of these students, again, these are Princeton theological seminary students, meaning they deal with theology and religion, Christianity and other religions, including Judaism, Kavayach. They're Christians. So he wants half of them a talk on employment opportunities when they graduate. The other one, like, what can they do? What are, what are students of divinity supposed to do with their degree? And the second one to talk about the Good Samaritan. Okay. The subjects were then told they would need to walk across campus to another building in order to present their talk to a group of divinity students. So if they're in one building of campus, they're going to have to go across campus. A significant variable was introduced into the experiment. Some presenters were told they were running late and they had to hurry across campus and some were told they had a few minutes to spare and they didn't need a rush. This is all an experiment that's being done. Strategically placed on campus was a man who appeared to have been mugged. It was part of the show. As each theological student made his way across campus, they would encounter him slumped in an alley, head down, coughing, groaning, maimed, wounded, desperate need of assistance. The purpose of the experiment was to find out who would stop to help, who would not stop to help, and why. Now, if you were doing this experiment, and I asked you for the conclusions... What would have you assumed? One would assume, given the fact that the people who were tested were religious seminary students of the Theological School of Divinity who are on their way to talk about Good Samaritan, which is a parable about religious people, Jews, who don't care about others. That's what you're going to be talking about. You would think from all the people, those who are going to talk about jobs and money and how to make money, okay. But half of the students are going to talk about a story where a beaten man was left alone by religious Jews who couldn't care less because they were busy with God. The results of this experiment, which you can look up, were stunning. I don't know if the word is stunning, but astounding. All of the students were well-versed in the Good Samaritan. 
Many of them were preparing to give a talk on the subject. But of the ones who were told they were running late, only 10% stopped to help the man in need. Of the group who knew they had a few minutes to spare, only 63% stopped to offer aid, even though the other 37% knew they had time. The decision to stop or not was largely, was largely governed by one mitigating factor, whether they were in a hurry to get across campus or not. Not when they spent a long time preparing ideas on the Good Samaritan. And even those who were not in a hurry, because they were told there's no reason to rush, only 63% stopped the other group, only 10%. I, when I read this the first time, I thought, Wow. When hurried or rushed, when I'm hurried, what happens? The beliefs that I hold so dear are not translated into real life, into my actions. Here you have a group of people. If on a good relaxed day you would ask them theologically, what's your opinion about helping a man who's groaning and maimed and wounded and mugged and desperately needs your aid, he might die. For sure, they would align their lives with these attributes of compassion and mercy. Yet, when they were in a hurry or in a rush, suddenly everything changed. Wow, how deep are these values inside of you? And you would think those who are lecturing on the topic, imagine I'm going to give a lecture in one of the most distinguished universities of the country about this topic, not kindness. I'm not talking about kindness. I'm talking about not being like the Kayan and Levi who allow an abandoned man to go unnoticed. This is what I'm talking about. How will I get up there and preach about it when I just fail to act myself and the consequences would be I would be a few minutes late. But I'm in a hurry. <laughs> I'm in a hurry or I'm stressed and my love and compassion go right out the window in a single moment of stress and anxiety. I lost my soul. I lost my conscience. It tells you about life. Everything would probably change with one variable. If that person was their child. But I want to tell you about one more person. And this is what I want to conclude with. I want to tell you about a person who still inspires me every day. And he's still around. He's a French Jew. His name is Adolfo Kaminsky. He's 94 years old today. And in my mind, he's one of the great unsung heroes of our times. And I'll tell you this story very briefly. It's an astounding story. It's 1944. Nazi occupied Paris. Adolfo Kaminsky and three Jewish friends are operating a clandestine laboratory to make false passports for children and families to be deported from France to Nazi death camps. If they can forge passports that show that these children are citizens of another country, a neutral country, a free country, they can get out. The youngest member of this group, its lab's technical director, is Adolfo Kaminsky. He is practically a child himself. The boy is 18 years old. For years, he never told the story. Recently, mamish recently, I think two or three years ago, a documentary and a book came out about his story, Adolfo Kaminsky's A Forger's Life. And I read excerpts of the, of the book, of the biography. He became a professional forger. How? He dropped out of school at the age of 13 to help support his family. He became an apprentice to a cleaners, somebody who owned the cleaners, who was a clothes dyer. And uh, which, which was then the precursor to the modern day cleaners that we call today cleaners. He spent hours under this boss of his figuring out how to remove stains. And he loved chemistry textbooks. He devoured chemistry textbooks. He did experiments at home. His boss was a chemical engineer. And the next day he would come and he would answer any of his questions on chemical engineering. 
Hitler marched into France in 1941. Jews began being deported to their deaths, and Kaminsky decided now is the time to become a skilled forger. The man single-handedly forged thousands and thousands of passports. He gave them to French Jewish children so they could be smuggled out of France and enter into other countries as supposed citizens of those countries. This 18-year-old boy, Mr. Kaminsky, saved between 7,000 and 10,000 Jewish children in France. 11,400 Jewish children were deported and murdered. In one scene, Kaminsky tells the following story in the book. He says he learned one day that in three days from now, 900 Jewish children will be arrested and sent to the gas chambers. This means he had three days to forge from scratch 900 passports to prove that they are citizens of other countries. He would have to stay up for nights to get this work done because every passport had to be forged with exceptional skill. As he, as he, as he said in the interview for the book, he said one tiny error and that person gets sent to their death. And the error could be as nuanced that the point that most of us wouldn't even catch it. But when they examined that passport, one tiny error meant a death sentence. This was a strenuous job to say the least. How can he manage to forge not one, not ten, not a hundred, nine hundred passports? And then he said, and I'm going to quote him, I made a simple calculation. It takes me one hour to make 30 documents. If I sleep for one hour... 30 Jewish children will die. He stayed up and he finished all of the 900 documents. 30 an hour. All the children were saved. When they asked him, how can you stay up days and nights? I mean, just your hands, forget the exhaustion. There was a girl there who came and she was putting food into his mouth. Because if he would stop for a moment to take the food, that means a child will die. So somebody was stuffing water and food into his mouth because for three days he had to eat and drink something. He said, because I knew that if I sleep for one hour, 30 children will die. Sleep he did not. So they interviewed him for this new book. And the interviewer asked him at the end, how do you feel about your accomplishments? And I thought he would say, I feel so grateful, I feel so humble, it's an incredible thing to know, you know, that I have done. And he answered, I think mostly about all the children I could not save. This is a person who has the genes of Moshe Rabbeinu and the genes of Moshe's stepmother who helped Moshe Rabbeinu reach this place. Now, most of us don't live such dramatic lives as Batya or Moshe or Adolfo Kaminsky. Even those of us who are drama queens and drama kings, objectively, our lives are not as dramatic. But that's really a very superficial perspective. Because this entire point is that it's not about drama. Every one of us sees often or seldom injustice in our midst. A Jew being beaten physically, emotionally, spiritually. We see it. We observe it. We have good calculations why we do nothing. We justify our passivity very often by claiming to ourselves that by staying out, we will achieve so much more. Let me work with the system. Let me work through the system. It may take years, but I invest in chickens, not in eggs. I will be far more effective. I am living in a palace. I'm living in an ivory tower. I'm calm. I'm comfortable. You want me to endanger all of it? 
including my reputation, including the shidduchim of my children, including the seminaries of my girls. So I should stand up for a helpless victim. And I'm not even going to accomplish so much. What do you think is anyway going to happen to me? I will be demonized. The victim will continue to suffer and nothing will have been achieved. And I say to you, how many youngsters and adults have lost their lives, their souls, their dignity, their confidence, their health from such types of calculations. Moshe, thank God, thought otherwise. That's what made him the first and timeless leader of the Jewish people. When you see an innocent soul suffering, never, ever stand by idly. Do something, save the person. It's true in a physical suffering, it's true emotional suffering, it's true psychological suffering, mental suffering, spiritual suffering. We sometimes encounter people who were beaten, beaten by life, beaten by circumstances, beaten by internal experiences or external experiences. We meet people who are suffering in one way or another. When you see this, when I see this, the last thing to do is to go back to my palace and sigh. The thing to do is to take a stand, save a soul, embrace a heart, kindle a spark. Indifference is not a Jewish word. Indifference is not a Jewish option. It's the first story told about the first Jewish leader because it remains the most important story of the Jewish people. Have a wonderful week. Yes. What about if it's the last part, obviously, what was just said? What about if it's for the sake of peace? Which a lot of rabbis will say, if it's for the peace of the family, or if it's, you feel what you're doing is the right thing, you're saving somebody, but it's going to be for peace. Sometimes there are factors that compete against each other. Sometimes in the name of zealous love, I can be destroying somebody or other people. So this is where a person needs to consult real people who care and are experts to get the right, appropriate response. Torah is a Torah of chesed, and it's a Torah of emes, and it comes together. Torah is a Torah of truth and a Torah of kindness. And therefore, we always have to be sensitive that in the name of kindness, we're not acting cruelly. So yes, yeah, sometimes I may look at this and look at this, and I may need help from people who understand the situation, but who care for the situation. But if the response says, oh, just, uh, just let it happen, that's not an option. That's just not an option. Well, it's not an option. So then what do you do? You have to figure out what to do and how to do. Okay. Real Torah, loisamad al dam reyacha, the Torah says. You can't stand by the blood of a friend. But this does not mean because I want to stone stand by his blood, so I start killing people. Then I'm becoming part of the problem, not part of the solution. So one needs real Torah guidance, but by people who are experts and care and are dedicated. So, so, you, have to, so you have to find the right people. You have to find the right people who care and are dedicated. Okay. Yeah. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.